All right, well, hello everyone, and welcome back. In today's video, we're going to go ahead and introduce amplifiers and the operational amplifier. All right, so goals for this video. First, we'll briefly review our new circuits tools that we have covered in the past videos. That includes source transformation, superposition, Thevenin and Norton's theorems, and also maximum power transfer theorem. Once we're done with our review, we'll explain how amplifiers work and how we can model them. We'll talk about the golden rules and assumptions we make for ideal operational amplifiers. And we'll start solving some problems and look at applications that we use amplifiers for. So let's go ahead and jump in. So in our past three videos, we have introduced several new tools that help us analyze DC circuits. So we covered source transformation and superposition as helpful tools to help us analyze circuits containing multiple sources. You'll remember source transformation allows us to exchange a voltage source and series resistor with a current source and parallel resistor, or vice versa. And superposition allows us to sum several sources working separately in order to find the total response. So if you'd like to review these further, I'd recommend you take a look at our previous video. We've also now covered Thevenin's theorem and Norton's theorem. And we learned that Thevenin's theorem allows us to take any linear circuit and we can replace that linear circuit with an equivalent circuit containing a single voltage source and a single resistor. You'll remember that voltage source is called our Thevenin voltage. The equivalent circuit's resistance is called our Thevenin resistance. Similarly, we learned about Norton's theorem. Norton's theorem is very similar to Thevenin's theorem, except instead of replacing with a voltage source and series resistor, we can replace any linear circuit with an independent current source and a parallel resistor. And here the Norton current is the value of that current source, and the Norton resistance is the value of the resistor. If you need a refresher on how we perform the Thevenin and Norton calculations, I'd recommend you check out our previous video on Norton and Thevenin. And finally, in our most recent video, we learned about the maximum power transfer theorem. We learned that the maximum power transfer theorem can help us figure out what conditions will allow maximum power to be transferred from a source to a load. Maximum power transfer theorem tells us that maximum power will be transferred from our source circuit to our load circuit when the following condition applies. We need the resistance of our load to be equal to the Thevenin resistance of the source. So if the source's Thevenin resistance and the load's resistance are equal, then maximum power will be transferred from that source to our load. Additionally, the maximum power transfer theorem tells us that the maximum power that will be transferred is given by the equation here. So if we know the Thevenin equivalent of our source, we can determine the maximum power we could transfer, assuming the load meets our requirements. Once again, if you need 
a refresher on maximum power transfer, please check out our previous video. All right, so before we move on, let's go ahead and do a quick review question, and then we'll cover amplifiers. So here's our review question. Suppose we are using a voltage source, which has a three ohm internal resistance. So again, this is our source here. So here we have a three ohm internal resistance. We connect this voltage source to a 50 ohm load. And we set the voltage source to supply one volt. And we need to answer the following three questions. First, we need to answer what is the maximum power our voltage source can transfer if maximum power transfer conditions were met. Then we want to find percent efficiency for transferring to the 50 ohm load. And then we want to see how long will it take for our source to deliver 1,000 joules of energy to our load. So if you see any questions asking you about the maximum power transfer, that should immediately give you a hint that we need to use the maximum power transfer theorem. So if you'd like, go ahead and pause the video and give this question a try. And we'll go ahead and explain it. So let's start with the first part, part A. What is the maximum power that we can deliver if maximum power transfer conditions are met? All right, so let's think about this. What does the maximum power transfer theorem tell us? Well, let's remind ourselves for maximum power to be transferred, we know that the Thevenin and resistance of the source must equal the load's resistance. So for the purpose of this question, let's assume that our source has our Thevenin and resistance of three ohms, because that's what we are given. And let our load be 3 ohms. So notice our load is actually 50 ohms in this question, but remember the first part wanted us to find out what is the maximum power that could be delivered if maximum power conditions were met. So let's, let's see what would happen if this condition would have been met. Well, we know that if that condition is met, if our source's Thevenin and resistance is equal to the load resistance, then P max, our maximum power transferred, is given by Vs squared over 4RT, where Vs squared is our source's Thevenin and voltage. And then, of course, the RT is the source's Thevenin and resistance. So let's substitute. 
in this case, we can determine that our P max must be equal to Vs squared, which is one volt squared, divided by four times RT. What's RT? RT is three ohms. So we have one squared divided by 12, or one twelfth watts. And if we math that out, that gives us about 0 0.0833 watts. So there you have it. If our source and our load were matched, if they were both 3 ohms, we would be able to transfer 0 0.0833 watts from the source to our load. So let's move on to the next part. Next part asks us to find the percent efficiency. Find the percent efficiency for power transfer using the 50 ohm load. So notice in this case, the Thevenin and resistance of my source is three ohms, but my load is 50 ohms. So in this case, maximum power transfer conditions are not met. So in this case, we can calculate our efficiency as the power transferred with our 50 ohm load divided by the power transferred with the max power conditions met times 100%. Because we know our 50 ohm load is going to not have optimal power transfer. We will be transferring less than the maximum power. Okay, well, we know. We know this value in our denominator. We know that that value is equal to 0 0.0833 watts. Because if maximum power transfer is met, we're transferring the most power we can. So that one we know. But we need to find how much power do we transfer if our load is 50 ohms. How would we find the power transferred to the 50 ohm load? Well, we know P is equal to IV or P is equal to I squared R. So to find power transferred, we just need to find our current I going through the circuit. How would we do that? Well, notice we just, we just have two resistors in series, right? So notice we can combine our series resistors. And this becomes an Ohm's Law problem. 
we can determine our current I in this case going through my, my series resistors. Well, that's just voltage divided by resistance, or 1 volt divided by 53 ohms. That gives us about 0 0.0188 amps. I can take that current and plug it back in to determine my power. So my power transferred for the 50 ohm load is equal to I squared R, or 0 0.0188 amps squared times my 50 ohms. If I math that out, I determine that that power will be equal to 0 0.0177 watts. So now all that's left is to substitute that value back in to my efficiency equation. So if I do that, I get 0 0.0177 watts divided by my maximum, which is 0 0.0833 watts times 100%. If I multiply through, that gives me about 21.2% efficiency. So definitely by not having our source resistor and our load resistor being equal, that caused us to lose a lot of efficiency in our power transfer. All right, let's go ahead and finish up with the last part. The last part of our question asks us, how long will it take to deliver 1,000 joules to the load? So here our load is the 50 ohm resistor. Well, let's take a look. Remember here, when we're talking joules, this is energy. Recall that one watt equals one joule per second. And we know from our part B, we're able to transfer 0 0.0177 watts to our 50 ohm resistor. So all that's left here is to do a unit conversion calculation. So here we have 1000 joules that we want to transfer, and we know that in one second we are able to transfer 0 0.0177 joules, right? Because this is a transfer rate of 0 0.0177 joules per second. One watt is one joule per second. So notice, all we need to do here is divide and cancel our units. So notice joules cancel, and we determine that it will take us about 56,000, and approximately 56,497.175, approximately that many seconds to transfer 1,000 joules. If I want that answer in hours, 
then I can just multiply times one hour over 3600 seconds. Seconds cancel. And I get about We have about 15.69 hours to transfer 1,000 joules. So there you have it. Please make sure you start getting comfortable with these maximum power transfer calculations and pay attention to units. You should find if you are very careful with your unit conversions, these problems should be fairly straightforward to complete. All right, so remember you're always welcome to reach out if you have questions on this. And let's go ahead and move on to amplifiers. So let's briefly just give everybody a sense of where we are heading. During the past few lectures, we have filled up a toolbox full of equations and strategies to solve DC circuits. But of course, as you may know, not every circuit in the real world is a DC circuit. And circuits can contain many other things besides sources and resistors. So we're gonna start talking about more complex circuits with more components. Amplifiers are going to be our last new topic before our first exam. And then after our first exam, we're going to start adding even more components to our circuits. So this includes capacitors, inductors, and AC sources. So let's go ahead and talk about what an amplifier is, why we care about them, and what tools we can use to solve amplifier problems. So what is an amplifier? You may have heard of amplifiers before. An amplifier, or informally an amp, is an electric device that can increase the power of a signal increases the strength of a signal, increases the intensity of a signal. And so it's used very commonly in many types of electronic devices. Amplifiers are very common in electronic equipment. You know, if you have any sort of communication device, any sort of device that's measuring a signal, you often need an amplifier in order to process that signal and make it measurable. We'll learn more later on about filters and how we commonly use filters in order to strengthen or block signals at different frequencies. Another common application is in sensors. If you're trying to detect a signal, you want to strengthen that signal, amplify that signal, but suppress noise or background that you don't care about. Also in communications, Amplifiers are really important, again, to strengthen the signals that we do want. And even in computers, we'll learn that these operational amplifiers that we'll cover today, they can be used to perform basic computations. And amplifiers, in fact, can be a very important part of computers. Often when students see amplifiers, you can think of an amplifier that you would connect something like an electric guitar to. And this actually isn't a bad visual. Basically what the amplifier does is we give the amplifier some input from a source, and then the amplifier will strengthen that signal and send it to some output or load. In this case, in this picture here, we're taking an electric guitar and amplifying the signal and sending it to some speakers. So before we dive into the details 
let's go through some important key terms that come up when we learn about amplifiers. So first key term is the operational amplifier. So when we talk operation here, we're not meaning operating room like for a surgery. Instead, when we're talking operation, we mean mathematical operations. So amplifiers, specifically operational amplifiers, are circuits that can perform math, such as adding, filtering, and integration. Another key term that comes up is integrated circuit. When we say integrated circuit, here what we mean is we have a collection of circuits that are fabricated on a silicon wafer. Why would that be important? Well, in the lab, we can often just quickly fabricate circuits using a breadboard and wires. And that's okay for, you know, a quick experiment or a prototype. But if you want to take your circuits and make them into a compact and robust product, like a computer or a smartphone, you can't just sell somebody a big pile of breadboards and wires. That circuit probably will be too big and bulky and too fragile. So having your electric circuits fabricated on a silicon chip allows you to make your circuits a lot smaller, a lot more robust, and you can put a lot more circuits in a very small space. So when we say integrated circuit, here what we mean is a large collection of circuits fabricated on that silicon wafer. Basically, large collection of circuits on a small chip, ready to use. Next is the non-inverting input. So the non-inverting input, also known as non-inverting terminal, is the amplifier's input with the positive sign. All right, so it's very important that you don't confuse the non-inverting input with the plus sign and the inverting input Notice the inverting input, also known as non-inverting terminal, is the input denoted by a negative sign. And you'll see if you are assembling these amplifier circuits in the lab or in a simulator, you need to be careful that you connect the correct inputs to that amplifier. So a couple other key terms to think about. Notice that the amplifier is not a passive component. Amplifiers are active components of circuits. They provide energy to our circuit to strengthen our signals. So amplifiers require some external power supply so that they can deliver power to our circuits. So you'll notice in this diagram, our amplifier actually contains a positive power supply and a negative power supply. And these are used to deliver power to the amplifier so that it can amplify our signals. And we can also use it to apply some bias voltages in order to change the behavior. We'll talk more about bias voltage later on in the course. When we say the term bias, what we mean is we're applying a voltage to the circuit component in order to control that component. So we'll worry about bias a little bit later. For now, just know that here, it's not like bias as in having a biased opinion. Instead, it's applying a voltage in order to control or influence the behavior of part of your circuit. And finally, of course, the output is our output signal from the amplifier. So typically this would be the output signal that has been strengthened or amplified relative to its input magnitude. Another really important amplifier term is the gain. So 
when we talk about gain, what we mean is the ratio between the input and output signals. So you see that typically we write our gain as letter A. So for example, if we were concerned with voltage, we could write our gain A as the ratio of our output voltage divided by our input voltage. Basically, by what factor by what factor is our input increased? So for example, if our output voltage was double the input voltage, then our gain would be two. We would have increased our input by a factor of two. So again, another example here, you can see if our output voltage here is three times the input, then our gain must be three because we tripled the magnitude of our input voltage. Another key term is this one called slew rate. We don't cover slew rate much in this course. What you need to know for our purposes is that slew rate is the maximum rate of change of the input voltage. If our voltage is changing too quickly, the amplifier may not be able to keep up. Again, we don't cover slew rate much in our course, but if you learn more about amplifiers in other classes, if you're dealing with high frequency signals or signals that are changing really quickly, then the slew rate may become important. Another important term is negative feedback. Negative feedback means connecting a circuit's output back to its input. So for example, if I were to do feedback from my output back into my input, and basically we do negative feedback in this way to help improve the basically the stability, reduce nonlinearity of our signal. So negative feedback basically helps improve the stability and, and help reduce the nonlinearity in our signals. We'll talk more about feedback a bit later on. All right, couple more key terms. Let's now talk about our amplifier symbols. So an amplifier on a circuit diagram will typically contain seven pins in total. So if we look at the complete symbol with all seven pins, it would look something like shown here. So this is an example specifically for the 741 operational amplifier. And so the complete symbol you'll see actually has all seven pins. We have pins one and five for what's called offset null. We don't really use offset null much in our course, but again, it's another parameter we can adjust in the circuit. Then we have pins two and three for our inputs. We have pin four for our negative power supply pin seven for our positive power supply, and pin six for our output. We'll see in a moment why the numbering is assigned the way it is. The numbers are assigned to help us when we're actually attaching these op amps to breadboards and other circuits. So this complete symbol has a lot of pins and Often we don't want to show all seven of them on a circuit diagram just because it can get kind of crowded. So more often we show the amplifier symbol shown here on this lower picture. And so typically what we do here is we omit the power supply pins 
and often also the offset null pins. So the only pins that we're actually physically showing are pins 2, 3, and 6. But here's the deal. Even if our power supply pins are not shown on the diagram, it's always understood that power pins must be connected for the op amp to work. This is really important, so I'm going to repeat it again. The op amps must be connected to the positive and negative power supplies. Otherwise, the amplifier doesn't have any power and it won't be able to amplify your signal. So even if the power supply pins are not shown in the circuit diagram, we assume that the power pins are still connected. It's just not shown. So be careful because if you're building op amps in the lab or in a simulator, you want to make sure you remember that you still need to connect the power pins. So a common mistake when running simulations or building these things in the lab is we plug in the inputs and outputs, but we forget to plug in our power supply. So remember to connect the power supply pins. Once again, also notice that we typically also omit the offset null pins. So for our purposes, we just leave those disconnected. We don't use them in this course. So let's talk now a little bit more about the operational amplifier. So as we said, an operational amplifier or an op amp can actually perform mathematical operations. That's why we call it operational, right? So we use these op amps to build circuits that perform mathematical operations. And you might remember when we talked about dependent sources, I said that dependent sources are used to model amplifiers. And so it turns out that operational amplifiers are active circuit elements which behave like voltage controlled voltage sources. So basically, we can say that our output voltage of our amp is equal to our gain times the inputs, or the input voltage. So it turns out that operational amplifiers, or op amps, have been developed and used for quite some time. So they were first developed in the 1950s and 1960s, and they were actually an important building block in computers. So we used them to make computers that are able to do math. And believe it or not, the operational amplifier is still one of the most widely used electronic elements. So let's take a closer look specifically at a special type of operational amplifier that is extremely common. So here we have one of the oldest and most widely used op amps, MicroAmp 741. I call it just the 741 operational amplifier. And this was one of the original op amps, oldest, most widely used, and it was 
designed by Fairchild Semiconductor, which later became Intel, one of the semiconductor companies. And so this op amp is typically packaged as this 8 pin DIP or dual inline package. So it's basically, it almost looks like a little bug. It has, you know, four legs on each side. If I attempt to draw it so that you can see all the little legs. So here you can see a picture of one of the op amps we use in our lab, and you see there are eight pins total, four on each side. So here I just took the picture against a yellow background and you see here are the actual pins. And notice that each of the pins on this operational amplifier will match the circuit diagram we talked about. And you might think, well, wait a minute. I thought this thing only had seven pins. Yeah, it turns out pin eight is actually not used. But you can also see if we compare the circuit diagram and the actual op amp we use in the lab, notice this little dot here. This dot is on the corner that's closest to pin number one. So pin one. Pin one is right here, so we can use this dot to help orient ourselves. So when we're building a circuit with this thing, we, we know that the pin closest to the dot is pin one, and then we have pin two, three, four, then five, six, seven, eight. So by comparing these pins with our circuit diagram, we can successfully use this thing to build circuits. You might also be wondering, well, why do we have such a funny shape? Why did we choose this eight-legged dual inline package for this op amp? And it turns out the reason why is so we can stick this thing into a breadboard. The pin spacing perfectly matches the holes in our breadboard. And so what you do is you can place this op amp in the breadboard so that the pins on either side are isolated. So in this case, notice our dot is right here. So we have pin one, two, three, and four, and then five, six, seven, eight, like that, right? So notice by dividing the op amp in half, we separate our inputs on one side from the output on the other side. So that's why it's very important Notice again, six is our output pin, and pins two and three are our input pins. So we want to always make sure, place the op amp so that it straddles one of the breadboard's gaps. That way, the input pins and the output pins are electrically isolated. They're not connected to each other. So another thing to think about is what's actually inside this thing. You know, we, we just see the, the eight pins sticking out, but if we were to open up this op amp, you'd see the circuit diagram for the op amp is actually quite complex. So notice 
there's these things here. These are transistors, which we'll talk about later. We've got resistors. There's a capacitor in here. There's lots of transistors, lots of capacitors. You can see where the different inputs go. But for now, what we're going to do is we're going to treat the 741 op amp as a black box. Rather than analyze what's going on inside every detail of this circuit, we treat the op amp as a black box with some inputs and an output. So we're going to focus on looking at inputs and outputs and how they follow certain rules. So let's go ahead and discuss what are these rules? What rules can we use to simplify operational amplifiers? So if you have any other questions up to this point, feel free to reach out. And let's go ahead and discuss what the rules are for ideal operational amplifiers. So you might have heard about the golden rule in philosophy or religion. The golden rule is often said to be, treat others as you want to be treated. That's a very nice rule. It's a good rule to follow. And it turns out that operational amplifiers have golden rules too. They're a little bit different than the philosophy one. But what we can do is to simplify operational amplifiers, we can make some assumptions. So we assume that ideal operational amplifiers follow some golden rules. And again, basically the goal here is to simplify the behavior. And we'll say that usually for our class, it's a pretty good approximation. So we'll talk more about non-ideal op amps later. Okay, so we said that an ideal operational amplifier must follow some golden rules. What are these golden rules? Well, these were developed by Horowitz and Hill in their book, The Art of Electronics. So they said that ideal operational amplifiers must follow these rules. So what are these rules? First rule, for an ideal operational amplifier, the current into each input terminal is zero. And the second rule is that the voltage that enters each of the two input terminals, the voltage must be equal. And you might be thinking, well, how does this help? Well, these golden rules help us simplify operational amplifier circuits. And in fact, they help us greatly simplify 
And as we mentioned before, usually the current centering, the amplifier, are pretty small anyway. Usually the voltage difference across the terminals is pretty small. So usually these rules are a good approximation. So in our class, generally, we will assume that our op-amp circuits have ideal behavior. So let's take a look at how we can use the golden rules to help us solve circuits that contain amplifiers. So let's try this first example. Here we are asked to use node equations to determine our output voltage V out in terms of V in and our resistors. And here we're given a hint that we should write node equations at the input nodes and apply the golden rules. If you'd like, you can pause the video and try this on your own. Otherwise, let's do it together. Okay, so first, let's remind ourselves what the golden rules are. The first golden rule says that the current entering the amplifier inputs must be zero. So that means, if I write on my figure, I have zero current entering my negative terminal, zero current entering my positive terminal. If we know that current is zero, that can help simplify our node analysis later on. Our second golden rule tells us that the voltage at the input terminals must be equal. So in this case, let's call my voltage at my upper input terminal V1. And let's call the voltage at my lower input terminal V2. So by the golden rule, V1 must equal V2. Well, wait a minute. V2 is connected to the ground, right? So here, since V2 is connected to ground, we know V1 is equal to V2, which is equal to zero volts. That means up here, my voltage V1 must be zero. Okay, so we got some good information from these golden rules. Okay, so now let's find V out in terms of V in and the resistors. Well, how can we get an expression relating V out and V in? Let's try node analysis. Suppose we have current I1 entering my node V1 from the left. And suppose I have I2 entering from the right and I3 exiting my node. So once again, I'm just going to assume some currents 
entering and exiting. Node V1. So what do I have? I have, by Kirchhoff's current law, I know that plus I1 plus I2 minus I3 must be zero. So I can rewrite this equation in terms of the node voltages. Notice current I1, that's just equal to Vn minus V1 over R1. Current I2 is going to be equal to V out minus V1 over R2. Then I have current I3 leaving, and then that must sum to zero. Well, wait a minute. I3 is equal to zero by the golden rule. We also know that V1 is equal to zero by the golden rule. Remember, since V2 is connected to the ground or zero volts, I know that V1 must also be sitting at zero volts. So if we simplify, we're going to get the following equation. We'll determine V in over R1 plus V out over R2 is equal to zero. So all we need to do now is rearrange. And we'll determine, in this case, V out over R2 is equal to negative V in over R1 or V out is equal to negative R2 over R1 times V in. So notice that the golden rules made it a lot easier to analyze this circuit. All right, so let's go ahead and continue on now with some good news and see how do we actually use this to build circuits which can do math. So let's cover our good news first. The good news is that we can use those golden rules to analyze any circuit containing ideal operational amplifiers. So as long as our op amp has ideal behavior, we can assume the golden rules must be followed. Generally, for the purpose of this course, we almost always assume ideal behavior. Here's the even better news. Standard amplifier circuit configurations exist. So what this means is that we don't have to do node analysis every time we see an amplifier circuit. Instead, if we can recognize these standard configurations, we can just use the equations that are already known and we can save ourselves time. In fact, we'll see in the example we just completed this is actually the equation for the inverting amplifier. Which we'll talk about in just a moment. So let's go ahead and talk more about how we can make these circuits easier to solve. How can we use these standard configurations to make it easy to have circuits do math? Before we dive in to op-amp configurations, there's one other point that we really need to bring up, and that is saturation. So 
One thing to remember is that op amps are active circuit elements, and so they cannot deliver infinite energy. They can only deliver the same amount of voltage as the range that we supply it with. So once again, an op amp's output voltage can never go outside the range of the supply voltages connected to our pins. For example, suppose we had a plus 25 volt connected to our positive supply and a minus 25 volt connected to our negative supply. For the case of this example, our op amp's output, it can only go from minus 25 to plus 25 volts. Our output cannot exceed the range of those supply voltages. So we bring this up because if we do try to exceed the supply voltage range, if we exceed the supply voltage range, we will see saturation. Basically, our voltage will reach a maximum or minimum value, and it will not increase or decrease further. So the important thing to remember here is that our op amp's output voltage can never go outside the range of our supply voltages. So as we drew here, in this case, if we happen to have the op amp connected to plus minus 25 volts, that means this output can only be from minus 25 to plus 25 volts. All right, so let's now jump in to those standard op amp configurations that we mentioned. And there are actually many kinds of op amps that are used. For now, we're just gonna focus on six of them, and we're gonna learn about more later on in the semester. And you'll see that each of these standard op-amp configurations can do a different type of mathematical operation. For example, the inverting amplifier, that one can multiply an input voltage by some negative constant. Non-inverting multiplies that voltage by a positive constant. We also have op amps that can do summing to some voltages and even subtract. One other thing to note is that you don't need to memorize these equations. So these would be provided on an exam, but know how and when to use these. We'll do some examples in the next few slides. So let's go ahead and look at these amplifiers one by one, and we'll see what each of these can do and what that amplifier circuit looks like. So our first amplifier configuration is the inverting amplifier. And we actually did this derivation in example one. So if you were to apply the golden rules, Kirchhoff's current law and Ohm's law to this inverting amplifier circuit, we can derive the relationship that our output voltage V out must be equal to negative Rf, that's the resistor up top here, divided by R1 times V in. Sometimes the inverting amplifier is also drawn in a slightly different way shown here. And so sometimes they, they show the V in relative to the ground other times they just show V in as a separate point. But 
Here it's assumed that V in and V out are measured relative to ground. So both of these are equivalent versions of the inverting amplifier. So here's our key takeaway. If you see circuits that look like these, you can recognize that this is an inverting amplifier and use this known equation here. Additionally, if you want to multiply an input voltage by a negative constant, then you can use this inverting amplifier to do that multiplication. All you would need to do is specify the values of the resistors RF and R1 so that you get the desired constant. For example, if we want V out equals negative 20 V in, we could specify, for example, we could have RF is equal to 20,000 ohms and R1 equal to 1,000 ohms. And then we would see that our output voltage would be increased by a factor of RF over R1 or 20. Also notice we do call this the inverting amplifier because it will multiply by a negative constant. So it will flip the sign. So that's the inverting amplifier. Let's go ahead and check the next one. How about the non-inverting amplifier? So this one's kind of similar except you'll notice that the non-inverting amplifier will multiply our voltage V in by a positive constant. And the sign is not changed. So we don't have a negative sign for the non-inverting amplifier. So both of these circuits here are inverting amplifiers. Notice the one on the top is drawn with V in and V out, just shown as points. The other one shows V in and V out measured relative to the ground. And both of these are equivalent. V in and V out are always measured relative to our ground. So you could derive this expression for the non-inverting amplifier by applying the golden rules and all of our node analysis tools to determine that V out must meet this relationship. So once again, the key takeaway here, if you see one of these circuits, or if you want to multiply an input voltage by a positive constant, you can use an inverting amplifier. And you can use this equation to design that amplifier. All you need to do here is specify the resistor values RF and R1 so that you get the desired constant that you want. So let's try a quick example before we move on. Suppose we wanted to design an amplifier circuit that can multiply an input voltage by negative 5. So we want our output voltage V out to be equal to negative 5 times our input voltage. So questions asking first, what type of amplifier would we use? And second, specify the resistor values so that V out equals minus 5 V in and explain our reasoning. 
One thing to note when you're specifying resistor values, it's a good idea to choose resistors that have a valid number of ohms that's convenient to find. So often we recommend specifying resistors that have values between 5 kilo ohms and 500 kilo ohms. The reason for this is because these resistor values are easier to find. If you specify some resistor value that is a really funky number, like 127 ohms, you know, there may, may or may not be a resistor you can buy off the shelf to, to give you that unusual number. So better to use resistor values that are easy to find. So let's give this a try. First, which type of amplifier circuit would we want to use? Well, here are the two that we covered so far. Remember, we want to multiply a voltage by negative 5, so that V out is equal to negative 5 V in. So if you look at the amplifier circuits we've covered, which one will allow us to do that? We have the non-inverting over here, non-inverting amplifier, and we have our inverting. In this case, notice the non-inverting amplifier can only multiply by a positive constant. So that's not what we want here because we want to multiply input by a negative constant. So here we want to choose an inverting amplifier. And that's because since we want to multiply by a negative constant. And now for choice B, we need to specify the resistors so that we get the desired behavior. So notice here we have V out is equal to negative RF over R1 V in. That means that RF over R1 must be 5. So we basically just need to choose two resistor values that meet that requirement. So here, let's choose between 5 kilo ohms and 500 kilo ohms, just so that we choose values that are easy to find. So I'm going to go ahead and choose, let's choose RF is equal to 50 kilo ohms, and R1 is equal to 10 kilo ohms. You'll see if I choose those two resistor values, then my ratio will be 5. So there's our answer for part B. All right, so now let's go ahead and continue with the rest of our standard op-amp configurations. Our next configuration is the voltage follower. This is also known as a buffer amplifier. And you might look at this thing and say, well, wait a minute. It doesn't really do anything. Because all we're doing is we're feeding some of our output voltage back in to our input. So the output voltage in this case we will find is equal to the input voltage. And notice we can also draw this amplifier two different ways, either with the voltages drawn individually or relative to the ground. But V in and V out are always measured relative to that zero volt ground. So why do we bother with this thing? Well, we know the voltage follower has a gain of one. 
it doesn't actually change our signal. But we'll see later on that it can help stabilize our signals and prevent undesirable oscillations. Our feedback helps stabilize the behavior of our circuits. So we'll talk more about this later on. For now, thing to remember is that our gain is one and the voltage follower or buffer amplifier helps stabilize our signals. Next, we have the summing amplifier. Once again, the summing amplifier can be drawn a couple of different ways. Notice sometimes we show the input voltages as ideal sources relative to ground. Otherwise, we just draw them as individual nodes. But both of these circuits are equivalent. Notice what the summing amplifier does. The summing amplifier will sum any number of input voltages. So you could have up to n inputs. You just keep on adding more and more resistors. And so notice how everything is connected to that input terminal. And so we can derive, if we use golden rules, we can show that this expression is true. So the key takeaway here is that the summing amplifier will sum its input voltages and follow the relationship shown in this equation. Also note that the sum is multiplied by negative one, and you do need to specify the resistance values so that the sum is calculated in the way that you want. It's also possible to design a non-inverting summing amplifier. So notice the non-inverting summing amplifier will also sum our input voltages. However, there is no multiplication by negative one. So the sign of our sum is not changed. However, the design for this summing amplifier is a little bit more tricky. Notice that we have to figure out what that constant k is. So we have these proportionality constants that are related to our resistor values in our amplifier. So the non-inverting summing amplifier is a little bit complex because of those constants. So I like to also bring up this point here, where one other alternative you can do is you can use a regular summing amplifier and then send the output of that summing amplifier through an inverting amplifier to get rid of our negative sign and produce the same result. So personally, if I ever needed to do a sum of voltages, I typically find it more convenient to more convenient to use a regular summing amplifier and then an inverting amplifier provided that I have two amplifiers available. Finally, we also have the difference amplifier. And so as its name suggests, the difference amplifier is used to subtract its input voltages. And notice you can draw it two different ways here. Again, showing voltages as individual nodes or as ideal sources relative to the ground. And we can see if we were to apply Kirchhoff's laws and the golden rules, we would end up with the relationship that our output voltage is R2 over R1 times the difference of our inputs.
So if you want to perform some subtraction, you can use the difference amplifier and specify the resistances to get your desired behavior. Let's go ahead and try one more example before we finish up for today. So let's try this one. This example is similar to something that might be on homework or exam questions. So suppose I wanted to design a circuit having one output voltage, V0, and two input voltages, V1 and V2. And we want our output voltage to be given by 6V1 plus 2V2. So notice we want to add. We want to add our input voltages V1 and V2 so that V out is equal to 6V1 plus 2V2. So if you'd like, take a moment and pause the video. See if you can figure this one out. Otherwise, let's do it together. First, let's think about which amplifier circuits should we use? So notice we're trying to do addition. So one approach is to use the non-inverting summing amplifier. Or the other option is to use the summing amplifier that is inverting and then send the output through an inverting amplifier. Again, this is to get rid of the multiplication by negative one. So again, depending on what you had available in the lab or what, what other stuff was happening in your circuit, either of these two options might be preferable. In our case, I'd rather not have to solve for those constants k, so I'm going to go ahead and choose this second approach. I'm going to use a summing amplifier and then send my output from that summing amplifier into an inverting amplifier. So here's what I have in mind. Notice we have our summing amplifier first. And in this case, our summing amplifier only has two inputs. We just have V1 and V2. And then we connect the output from our summing amplifier that output goes into our inverting amplifier. And notice here our inverting amplifier can multiply our, out our input by negative 1 in order to give us our desired result V0 is 6V1 plus 2V2. So our output here, that output is actually going to be negative 6V1 plus 2V2. So we've got to get rid of that negative sign by passing through to our inverting amplifier. 
So now we know what amplifiers we're using. The next step is to choose our resistor values in order to have the desired behavior. So for our inverting amplifier, notice we want RF over R1 to be 1 because we just want to multiply by negative 1. So in this case, we can just choose two values here so that those are equal. But notice in our summing amplifier, we need some slightly different relationships. In this case, I need RF over R1 to be 6 to get 6B1, and I need RF over R2 to be equal to 2. So in this case, we just need to make sure we choose values that are reasonable for those resistors. So for example, I could choose something like this. I could choose for my summing amplifier, I could let my RF value be 60 kilo ohms. And then that would allow my R1 value, if I want to be six times as much, I could let my R1 be 10 kilo ohms. That way, RF divided by R1 would be six. Similarly, if I want RF over R2 to be two, then I can let my R2 be 30 kilo ohms. That way, 60 kilo ohms divided by 30 kilo ohms gives us that ratio two. And similarly for my inverting amplifier, I just need my R1 and RF to be equal. So here I can just go ahead and choose, I'll just let both of these be 60 kilo ohms. But by choosing my resistors in this way, I know that my final voltage will satisfy the relationship that we want. Hopefully now everybody's a little bit more comfortable with how amplifiers work and how we can model them. Make sure you recognize those golden rules and the key assumptions that we make for ideal operational amplifiers. And finally, use this as an opportunity to get comfortable working on amplifier problems. In our next video, we'll take a closer look at some applications but you'll see that by using the golden rules and the standard op-amp configurations, it's actually fairly straightforward to solve amplifier problems once you get the hang of it. Thanks everyone for joining the fun, and we'll see you all in the next video.